but I will say we um, not everyone who signs up or registers attends. So we have a great group. That's great. Hi, y'all. Hi, everyone. Hello. So I'm just letting some people into the room. Um, welcome to Wednesday in the Stew, uh, especially if this is your first time um, or if you are joining us again. Uh, since it's already 4.02, I am just gonna go ahead and hand it over to um, a facilitator today so that uh, we can get started. Um, I'm gonna put this in the chat, but today's session is being recorded. Um, it may or may not pop up on our YouTube, um, but just so you are aware, it's being recorded. Put that in the chat. Awesome, we can get started if you're comfortable. Okay, great, thank you so much. And welcome to all of you. I'm so happy to be talking about lineation with all of you and I'm thrilled to see um, so many new faces, but also several familiar faces, including some people I have not seen before the pandemic or, or earlier. Um, so you know who you are and I'm super happy to see you and excited to get to know the rest of you. I am Ruba Ahmed and I'm calling in from Delaware County just outside of Philadelphia and I'm a poet and an educator. Um, and I am gonna take you through a version of a class uh, that I teach called Lineation Lab. Um, but today's focus will be much more on thinking about the strategies while we experiment with other people's work. Um, and in the class that I teach, the focus is much more heavily on experimenting with your own work so that you can arrive at multiple versions of lineated poems with your own draft um, material. So I'm gonna share the screen here. And um, for those of you who kind of like to know where we're headed when we start off in a, in a session like this, um, this is sort of our loose agenda and you know we can make adjustments as we go along but essentially we'll start with um, introductions we'll do a brief self-reflection key ideas and then we'll do some experience experiments with the work of others top secret <laughs> feels like sacrilege to mess with someone else's material and line breaks but i think it is a good way to learn and then we'll do some experiments with our own work um so what i'd love to do is just start with um introductions and let me look at the size of our group and see how we can do this. Um, okay, given the size of our group, let's go ahead and put names, uh, name, location, and preferred pronoun if you'd like into the chat. And if you can also change your screen name so that it matches how you'd like to be called and the pronouns you'd like to be addressed by, that would be great. Um, I'm just gonna pull up the chat here so I can see. So I'll start I'm here, Delco and my pronouns are she, her, and I go by Rupa. So all my official stuff is still never actually gone by that. Um, so as those are coming in, um, I just wanted to put forward our mission for today. So in the next hour or so, our mission is to um, experiment with lineation in ways that I hope will give you a greater sense of confidence about experiment, uh, about lineating your work with expression and with confidence. I know so many times people say in workshops, like, I don't really know where to begin with lineation. And it's true, it can be really befuddling because there's no, it's not a science. It's really much more of an art. And so there are no clear answers about, you know, no final answers about how to lineate any material. It's all a matter of the choices we make and the effect it has on the poem. Um, so what I'd like to do is just jump back here and take a moment for some self-reflection. So I have two self-reflection questions here, um, and I'm going to ask you to just jot this down on a piece of paper or put it into a file on your computer. And if you'd like, you can also share it in the chat. And the two self-reflection questions are, what are some of your current challenges or questions related to lineation? And what's the most... Um, I'm sorry, this should say challenges, not two separate questions. So what are some of your most current challenges related to lineation? And what's the most urgent question you have about lineation? So take about, you know, just a, a minute or so to think about that. And if you'd like, please share it in the chat.
Okay, take another few seconds to kind of wrap up whatever thought you're on, whether you're writing it down on a piece of paper or putting it in the chat. Um, and so I see some questions here about how to determine line length, um, questions about capitalization related to lineation, um, how lineation contributes to the purpose of the poem, and um, how things might change from line to line. Okay, as well as some questions about how lineation can bring uncertainty and drama to the next line. Um, finding ways to lineate in, in, uh, that are authentic to the work and not gimmicky. Um, so these are all great um, challenges and questions that you're posing. And my hope is that you'll be walking away with a couple of strategies that will address many of these questions. Um, so I'm just gonna jump back to this file and start with a uh, few key ideas. So this is actually here. All right. Okay. So sometimes people who are new to the genre or who've been working in the genre might say like, I don't exactly know how to define what's different about poetry versus prose. And um, when it comes down to it, there are two major distinguishing features. Um, one is the use of sounds and sonic qualities to create expressive rhythms and music in poetry, um, which is not to say prose writers don't do that. Prose writers definitely make use of sonic qualities, but that aspect is heightened and emphasized in poetry, uh, sort of you know at another level. So prose writers, I know you, <laughs> I know there's some in the room. So I know those are tools that you use as well. The other distinguishing feature is the line, the fundamental unit. So we think about the, the sentence in prose writing. The sentence is the fundamental unit. The sentences make up paragraphs, and then those paragraphs build toward the larger piece. In a poem, the line is the, is the fundamental unit. And the lines create sentence, you know, build towards sentences or are part of sentences. Um, and a sentence can be strung across several lines. And those lines build toward uh, stanzas or if it's, you know, depending on what your stanza formation is, it may be one stanza or it may be multiple stanzas. So in short, sentences in prose, sentences make up paragraphs and in poetry, lines make up stanzas, kind of sim simplistic version of it. Some of the key ideas here are related to um, some of the questions I saw in the chat. So it's important for us to keep in mind that line breaks affect meaning and they can do that by stressing certain words or shifting meaning as you move from one line to another, and they have some bearing on the music of the poem. So as writers, we can create a lot of different effects through our lineation choices, including uh, contributions to tension, music, of course, expectation and surprise, and that's all done by playing the sentence against the line. So I kind of think of it, I'm not a musical person, but I kind of think of it as, you know, a, a measure of music, you know, on the on a, a sheet of uh, staff, on the musical staff. So we can kind of string our sentences across this um, lineation grid, so to speak, for different effects. Okay, let me just jump back here. Some other key ideas. This first one is saying essentially what we've already talked about. You can work your you know, sentences against the line or with the line in order to create different effects, different kinds of pacing um, to emphasize or de-emphasize certain words. And all of these choices are going to put pressure on the poem in ways that affect pacing and tension. And that tension comes out of what's happening between the grammatical unit of the, in the sentence and the line where we choose to break it. So I have a couple of quotes here from one of the great experts on the line, and that's James, James Longenbach. And these are from an essay called The End of the Line. Longenbach says, poets need a highly nuanced line to keep our poems from standing still. And more than that, we need a line capable of many different effects. One that will save us from mere repetition of the same effect, however compelling it may be. He also says, line determines our experience of the poem's temporal unfolding. Its control of intonation creates the expectation for meaningfulness, an expectation that thrills 
because it might as easily be might be as easily thwarted as fulfilled. So we're working with the idea of expectation and surprise. Um, so here on this slide, I have a bunch of terms that if you've been in other workshops, you're, it's likely you've heard these terms thrown around. Just give me a little wave if the, the terms on this page look relatively unfamiliar, uh, familiar, not unfamiliar, relatively familiar to you. So end stop line and jam line, sejura and white space. I see you know, some, some folks out there waving. These are some of the basic, excuse me, basic terms we use when we talk about lineation. So an end stop line is working in concert with the grammar of the, the sentence. So the line ends at a spot where we might take a natural breath or at a place where the sentence uh, ends. Maybe there's some end punctuation there to indicate that. Um, and the MO here is um, Mary Oliver. This comes from her tiny book called The Poetry Hand Handbook. She says, an end stop line, or we can call it a self-enclosed line, may be an entire sentence, or it may be a phrase that is complete in terms of grammar and logic. In other words, it follows the syntax. And the effect this generally has is that it slows the poem down. So we're sort of pausing after each line, taking a breath, and um, that stands in contrast to the next type of lineation choice, which is enjambment. Um, Mary Oliver, as Mary Oliver puts it, enjambment turns the phrase so the logic of the phrase is interrupted. So, Instead of breaking where it would make sense to kind of go along with the grammar, it's sort of in accord with the grammar, we can cut across that and create deep enjambment that um, really we're kind of, we're hardwired to seek out syntactical fulfillment. So if something is enjammed, our brains are just hardwired to keep moving forward to figure out like, I've encountered the subject of the sentence, but what's the verb or whatever the case might be, whatever the incomplete part is. Um, so jam and generally has the effect of building speed, right? Driving the reader down the page with this desire for syntactical fulfillment. Um, and it creates tension, right? It's pushing your reader down the page and creating tension um, so that we don't get that kind of pause or a moment of respite from the end, as we do with the end stop line. Um, sometimes, and I know someone asked, noted this in the chat, sometimes we can have a little bit of a meaning shift as we move from one line to another. Um, and that could happen with an end stop line as well as an end jam line, really. Um, but the idea is that maybe there's a little bit of shift in meaning. So you read the word at the end of the line a certain way, but then as you read on to the next line, you realize there's another layer of meaning or a shift in meaning. And that's something that can be fun and exciting and maybe, you know, <laughs> can be done in moderation. I, I, I have yet to see a poem that does that with great frequency without it becoming gimmicky. So if you find one, send it to me because I, I'm very stubborn about rules when it comes to poetry. So every time I say like, you can't really do this, I immediately think, surely someone has and they've done it well and I just haven't read it yet. So email me <laughs> if you've seen a poem that makes great use of those meaning shifts across uh, the line breaks over and over in a way that doesn't feel gimmicky. Then these other two terms, sejura is just a fancy word for pause. Um, a structural and or logical pause, and it can sometimes be used to create drama in a poem, right? It can be kind of like a revelatory moment. Um, other times it might be a moment of, of just, you know, a, a rhythmic pause in the work. And then white space, um, which can have a role in breath and pacing as well as rhythm. Okay, so that's, Jumping ahead, let me move back here. So those are some of the key ideas to for us to kind of keep on the table. In the other classes that I teach, we do a fuller version of talking about lineation and all the different kinds and go through several multiple examples of different poems that um, you know use in jam it or use end stop lines or have short lines and have long lines and every combination of, of those um, that that we can imagine. In this class, what I'd like to do is really focus on the strategies you can take away for your own writing. Um, so we're gonna dig right in to some experiments. And um, I, it's not an actual word, but I like to, I like to call this uh, working with prosified texts. And the idea is that I've taken some poems from out in the world 
tried to find some poems, at least some of them are poems that I hope will be less familiar to folks. And I've put them all into a paragraph form. So it's just a big block of prose. I've taken all the line breaks out. And the idea is that we're gonna take those blocks, those paragraphs and insert line breaks with certain um, goals in mind. So some of those goals are listed here. We're gonna try around where we lineate for sense. And that usually means we're lineating for syntax, sort of like a, com a complete thought or a phrase that conveys a complete sense of its meaning. Um, that's one round that we'll do. Then we'll do a round where we're kind of looking through another lens. We're thinking, how do we lineate this block of text in a way that creates surprise? And so that might be some of those meaning shifts that I talked about that might be using enjambment. Um, we're just gonna look at it with that kind of lens and see how that goal affects our lineation choices. Then we'll do a round where we're going to lineate for sound. So we're gonna think about like, okay, you know, maybe this poem is full of rhymes and I want to really draw that out. So I'm gonna put the rhymes at the end of a line or maybe I want to really obscure them, you know, make them subtle. And so maybe I'm tucking them into the middle of the line and then jamming on words that are not related to the rhymes. And then space, which is kind of wide open. Um, when we think about white space on the page, there are so many different possibilities. So it might be fragmenting the lines. It might be um, creating lots of space in between lines. It might be thinking about both fragmentation and the space in between stanzas. Um, so that's another kind of experiment, experimentation we can do. So what I'm going to do is um, bring up a poem that I've squished into this prose form taken out all the line breaks. Don't tell the poet if you happen to know them. It always feels like sacrilege. Um, but the idea is that we can use this material that is not ours to do some experiments without feeling the kind of obligation or investment that we have in our own material. Um, so this is the text of a piece called Eating Together by Lee Young Lee. I'm going to copy and paste it into the, into the chat. And what I'm going to ask you to do is um, to pick I think in the time we have a couple of different aspects, and I'll copy this here, um, and do at least a couple of different versions of lineation on this piece. And what I recommend is you can copy and paste it out of the chat and put it into a new file, you know, hit return after each line break that you make, and then you can usually copy and paste that directly into the chat to share with us afterwards. Some people um, put in a slash to indicate the line breaks and that, that works just as well. So you can choose. Um, so let's do around, let's take about five minutes. And in that time, copy and paste this text and pick two aspects that you'll lineate for. So one round, maybe you're saying, I'm gonna lineate this with surprise. I'm gonna try to create surprise. And then in my second round, I'm gonna lineate with sound in mind, whether that's heightening sound, or maybe obscuring sound, or, or doing a little bit of both at different points in the poem, depending on what the poem seems to call for. Um, and when we, when we lineate our poems, we don't often sort of isolate one aspect like this, but the idea is that we can build a kind of muscle memory for this kind of aspect one at a time, so that maybe when we sit down with our poem, with our draft material that we've been wrestling with, we can bring all of those aspects together and move through our own lineation in a way that's more intuitive. But just like, um, you know, you can think of this as sort of like the runner running laps or the dancer at the bar doing exercises, we're kind of isolating each aspect for the sake of the process of thinking, you know, building that mus muscle memory to say like, here's how I'm making the choice. And then later we wanna ask the question, well, what's the effect? Is this a moment in the poem where I should be lineating with sound in mind or surprise in mind, or is that too much? Do I need to think of some other aspect? Um, so part of the process is figuring out what works, but we'll also be figuring out what doesn't work, which can be just as illuminating. So um, is everybody clear on what to do during the next five minutes? Copy and paste, pick two aspects, and then I encourage you to share those in the chat so that we can read a couple of versions out loud and discuss the different effects. All right, I'm gonna set a timer and then we'll uh, share these versions in five minutes.
Okay, go ahead and try to wrap up whatever uh, part of the poem you're on. And um, it'd be great if you could share whatever, you, whatever part you were able to lineate um, in the chat. Okay. Um, and then what I'd love to do now is to hear some of these versions out loud and to compare the different effects. So um, thinking about these different aspects that we tried to delineate for, um, let's just go through them in, this, in the order that's on the page here. So um, I'll start. I saw in the chat that Navneet had a question about end stop line. So as an example, I lineated this with largely end stop lines. And um, so I'll read this out loud and then we'll hear from someone who did lineation for surprise and for sound and for space so we can kind of listen to and look at these versions side by side. So lineating for, uh, for sense with a, an emphasis on end stop, end stop lines, retaining the meaning, the full meaning of the phrase in each line. Here we go. In the steamer is the trout seasoned with slivers of ginger, two sprigs of green onion, and sesame oil. We shall eat it with rice for lunch, brothers, sister, my mother, who will taste the sweetest meat of the head, holding it between her fingers deftly, the way my father did weeks ago. Then he lay down to sleep like a snow-covered road, winding through pines older than him, without any travelers, and lonely, for no one. So we could argue there that some of those lines are kind of in jam because the, the, the sentence goes on to elaborate on a phrase. But for the most part, I was trying to uh, include a complete thought or grammatically complete phrase on each line. Um, let's hear from someone who lineated for surprise. You can kind of give me a wave, use your um, hand emoji, or just unmute yourself. Navi, Navni, go ahead. Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm at work, so it sometimes noisy in the background. Navneet, you're cutting Ooh. out a little bit. <laughs> so, sorry, sorry. Um, um, oh, I can read it from the Word document, sorry. So, in the steamer is the trout, seasoned with slivers of ginger two sprigs of green onion and sesame oil, and brother's sister. My mother will taste this. Namni, we're losing you, sadly. Um, ah, I tried to copy and paste her version into the chat, but it took all the lines, line breaks out. So if you scroll upwards in the chat box a bit, you'll see Navneet's name and her version of alineation. But Namni, we're not quite able to hear you, unfortunately, um, with the connection. Um, but it sounds like you were lineating with uh, surprise in mind. Is there anyone else who uh, lineated with a sense of surprise in mind, looking through that kind of lens at the work? Charles, go ahead. No. Okay, I'm unmuted here. In the steamer is the trout seasoned with slivers of ginger, two sprigs of green onion and sesame oil. We shall eat it with rice for brother for lunch, brothers, sister, my mother who will taste the sweetest meat of the head holding it between her fingers deftly the way my father did weeks ago. Then he lay down to sleep like a snow covered road winding through pines older than him without any travelers and lonely for no one. Thank you, Charles. And um, so when you were lineating, you were lineating with the idea of surprise in mind, is that right? Yes. 
Um, and thank you for, you know, really stopping at the line break so we can hear very clearly where you made your lineation choices. That's very helpful since some people might be able to find it in the chat. I tried to paste Charles's version into uh, the last part of the chat as well. Um, let's hear from someone who lineated with sound in mind. And if you could do a similar, you know, really pause at your line break so we can hear where they are, that would be great. And if nobody lineated with sound in mind, that's okay. This is Emily. I sort of did a little bit um, for sort of musicality. Um, in the steamer is the trout seasoned with slivers of ginger, two sprigs of green onion and sesame oil. We shall eat it with rice for lunch, brothers, sister, my mother who will taste the sweetest meat of the head, holding it between her fingers, deftly the way my father did weeks ago. Then he lay down to sleep like a snow covered road, winding through pines older than him without any travelers and lonely for no one. Thank you, Emily. And I was able to paste yours actually into my file, which is probably a little easier to see. Emily, do you have a comment or two on some of the moments where you felt like you were really able to draw out the sign, the sound, or to de-emphasize it? I know I probably cheated a little because I did a little surprise in there too, or at least twist. But I liked the um, at the beginning the seasoned green eat um, at the end of the lines, sort of playing on that sound, and it also picks up the meat and the sleep that come up later. Um, so, but I also liked with rice for lunch, brother, sister, and then my mother on the next line. So it had, I mean, there was some other line break stuff going on too, but I liked that, um, that end sound being repeated. Yeah, absolutely. We can really hear that and see it in this version. And um, and I think, you know, what you were saying about like, well, some moments surprise came in, that's, that's sort of the end goal, right? To be able to sit down with a piece of material and lineate it in ways that are organic and authentic to the moment. So we're, we're kind of going through art artificially with each of these lenses and lineating. But of course, you know, my hope for you is that when you sit down, you're drawing on all those moments from moment to moment to make the choice that's best for that part of the poem. Rahul, you had your hand up. How are you, by the way? I'm good. It's so lovely to see you. This is such a great workshop. Yeah, I lineated for, I think I, I lineated for sound. Um, I think I was also thinking a little bit about, so, and, and I think I think what Emily said, musicality, I think I think I was thinking a little bit about surprise, white space. Um, so I don't know, I guess I'll, I'll just, do you want me to just read mine or? That would be okay. great. Um, in the steamer is the trout seasoned with slivers of ginger, two sprigs of green onion and sesame oil. We shall eat it with rice for lunch, brothers, sister, my mother who will taste the sweetest meat of the head, holding it between her fingers deftly the way my father did weeks ago. Then he lay down to sleep like a snow covered road winding through pines older than him without any travelers and lonely for no one. And so I guess some of the things I was thinking about is like in the, you know, like in the first stanza, I was looking at seasoned sprigs, um, and then I, I think in the, like the next line, onions, and then the 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 stanza break oil, um, rice, sister, um, in the a couple stanzas down, did down, um, you know, and I really wanted that um, that lonely <laughs> that loneliness to be on a line by itself um, after, which is maybe like a little gimmicky. I don't know, maybe that. Like maybe that's a little too gimmicky, but um, you know, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, it's a great question to ask, right? But so much fun to experiment with and to say, like, okay, what happens if I go from a line, a stand or curses, and then break that as the poem comes to an end, so that there's one line getting so much, you know, sort of airtime and emphasis that creates a lot of drama and tension in the poem. 
and also contributes to closure, right? So there's this kind of shift that happens that signals we're approaching the end of the poem. But a great question to ask, like, all right, have I put too much pressure on the poem? Was that too much drama, too much emphasis? Um, and in the end, there's no right or wrong answer, right? It's gonna come down to how does this sound when I read it out loud? How does it feel as we move through you know, the rooms, the stanzas in the poem? Um, and it's subjective in the end, right? It's gonna depend on our own aesthetic preferences if we feel like, whether or not we feel like that's right for the poem. Um, and just going back to some of the choices here that, you know, it, it's amazing when you dig into someone's poem like this, how sometimes how many sonic devices are at work that you don't really recognize when you read it or hear it the first time. For example, I noticed these S sound, but I didn't really, you know, think much about the oil and onion having that O sound, um, nor did I notice, you know, consciously the D sounds here that Rahul is really emphasizing by putting at the end of the line. Um, and then there's this kind of drive down to that last line that's getting so much emphasis that we're, you know, sort of asking about um, because syntactically the, the the line is just moving us down the page, right? We're being driven down the page. Then he laid down, okay, and stop line. But but it's sort of, you know, we're still wanting to find out more. Then he laid down what, where, what's happening? To sleep like a snow covered, okay, deep and jamming here, right? And that's driving us across a stanza break too. So that's a lot of white space to bridge with this deep and jam. It's really being driven down the page. Snow covered road winding through pines. So we get snow covered getting, you know, a little bit more emphasis in time by landing at the end of that stanza and, and arriving, you know, we arrived there just before that white space. And then winding and pines have that, you know, wonderful sun quality right there on the same line together snow covered road winding through pines again like we can take a pause there that's kind of an end stop line but this the syntax of the sentence is still moving us forward and we know okay there's no punctuation but this is a poem that has taught us it has pretty standard punctuation so we keep going older than him end stop line end stop punctuation breath right so there's there's this moment of respite there's a moment of pause a little bit more emphasis on that line and then we pause uh right before without any travelers. And, okay, then again, jumping across the stanzas, a big, you know, chasm to bridge with this lineation um, and jamment, and also this, you know, sort of like, and what, you know, we're moving towards something that feels momentous and dramatic. And then we get it, right? We get it in that last line, lonely for no one. It's a very, um, very plaintive ending. So, you know, I, th I think in these versions, as we look across, we can start to see how it really is almost impossible to, to isolate just one sense. These other senses are bound to come in. But if we emphasize one at a time, it might help us figure out, okay, if this is a, you know, really bringing out the music and that's a choice I want to make. Or it might be a matter of figuring out, wow, this is really too much S sound for my aesthetic preference. I've got to obscure that, those sounds a little bit by tucking them into the middle of the line. It really comes down to, you know, what, what feels authentic to the work in our reading of it and our own, you know, our, our own preferences. Um, did anyone else have a version they'd like to share and read out loud? And Charles, was your hand up from before, your emoji hand, or is, did you have a question for us? No, that was up from before. Okay, no problem. Let's do another one. So same exercise. Um, this one is Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, some of you, I imagine many of you have seen it before, but I couldn't resist including it. I'm just going up here so I can copy and paste the different senses. Um, oops. Okay, sorry, my keys are not cooperating. All right, so same idea. I'm going to paste this um, prosified sort of poem by Gwendolyn Brooks into the chat and our test is to lineate it. Um, try to keep in mind one of these senses if you can as sort of your main lens, but if other things happen spontaneously, you know, don't hold back, do what feels intuitively right for the moment and try to think about why, you know, why did I wanna break from lineating for surprise at this moment or break from lineating for space at this moment. Um, so take about four or five minutes and then I hope you'll share your version in the chat uh, with a label at the top that says space, 
or sound or sets, whatever you're kind of focusing on in your version.
let's go ahead and wrap up whatever part we're on. And I invite you to share your version in the chat. Um, I have tried to lineate with space in mind because I saw uh, there's a question in the chat about like, what what is lineating for space? What does that look like? What does it mean? And really it can be, you know, space broadly construed. It can be spaces between words, between phrases, between lines, between stanzas. Um, it can be irregular spacing or very consistent spacing. Um, so this version that I did, I tried to make a little fragmented, um, in the beginning, at least, I tried to draw out some of the rhymes through the way I broke the phrases down. So I'm just going to read the first half of this um, because I'm eager to hear your versions. They eat beans, mostly, this old yellow pear. Dinner is a casual affair. Plain chipware on a plain and creaking wood, tin flatware, two who are mostly good. Two who have lived their day, but keep on putting on their clothes and putting things away. So, you know, I was trying to create a kind of breathiness, maybe like a stop start feeling, uh, a feeling of thoughts unfolding as the, you know, as the mind is working. Um, I am eager to hear your version. So who'd like to share their version? Just kind of let us know what you had in mind, which aspect you were thinking of in your experiment. Um, Tim, go ahead. Hi, um, I did like sound, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I really like the rhymes and I really like how it just kind of unfolded, like you were saying, like it, it developed in an interesting way without really needing a meter. Okay, here we go. Um, they eat beans mostly, this old yellow pear. Dinner is a casual affair. Plain chipware on a plain and creaking wood, tin flatware two who are mostly good, two who have lived their day, but keep on putting on their clothes and putting things away and remembering, remembering with twinklings and twinges as they lean over the beans in their rented back room that is full of beads and receipts and dolls and cloths, tobacco crumbs, vases and fringes. Thank you, Tim. And so you you were um, thinking of sound, and so can you give us you know maybe point out a moment or two where you felt like you were really drawing out the sound or doing the opposite, you know, sort of trying to obscure it. Um, I think that the 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 stanza that's really exciting to me is the third one because, like I'm saying, like I think the meter of this poem is really interesting, and I think the first two stanzas kind of establish a convention, and then the third stanza interrupts it in like a really satisfying way, um, to where like you still get the rhyme, but there's just like this little extra idea in it that like to me really draws out the relationship between the two people and like sort of how long they've been doing this um, and how much they've sort of accumulated. And I think that that kind of carries over really nicely into the like last half of the poem where it doesn't rhyme so much, but like there's lots of, there's just like a lot of accumulated sounds that I think just go nicely with one another. I really like tobacco crumbs because it doesn't really fit with anything, but it just kind of carries through really nicely. Yeah, it's interesting to think about expectation and surprise with this poem, both in terms of content, as you pointed out, Tim, with this list where it's sort of like, you know, um, miscellaneous and um, tobacco crumbs kind of standing out, but also this really um, interesting moment you pointed out with stanza three, where we go from almost a kind of couplet rhyme to this extra phrase that's inserted, right? Two who have lived their day. Um, you know, which might make a really clean rhyme with uh, a shorter phrase coming right after, but that line goes on, but keep on putting their clothes and putting things away. So you get the repetition of putting a longer sentence and all that comes to um, emphasize the ongoing nature of the pudding, right? They keep on putting. And so it does come as a surprise. There's an expectation that's, that uh, Brooks sets up and then she shifts it. And that's something interesting to think about in so many different aspects, but here we, we see it playing out musically. And so the line breaks here emphasize both the pattern that's set up, pair, affair, wood, good, but then as a result also emphasize the variation that takes place in stanza three. Um, other, let's hear from a couple of other people who'd like to share their version and tell us what you had in mind.
Any brave souls? Joe, let's hear from you. Mine isn't that much different than Tim's, but there is some, some difference to it. And what did you have in mind? Well, basically, it just seems to me that tension versus meaning are the two abstract things that come up every time I uh, think about uh, where I'm going to break a line. Not, not so much uh, the sound, which is an interesting thing that I'm, I'm learning today. They eat beans mostly, this old yellow pear. Dinner's a casual affair, plain chipware on plain and creaking wood, tin flatware. These two have lived their day, but keep on putting on their clothes and putting things away. And remembering with twinklings and twinges as they lean over the beans in their rented back room, full of beads and receipts and dolls and cloths. Tobacco crumbs, vases, and fringes. Thank you, Joe. Do you want to maybe point us to a moment where you really felt that tension around the line break and the meaning? Uh, but, well, you know, obviously, you're, you're, there's sentences that, like, the dinner is a casual affair. First part is a statement, and then the rest of it is a description. I think that the real break in the tension and meaning is between there and these two have lived their day, but they keep on going on. Uh, actually, I have an aunt who's 91 who's expressed almost the same thing to me. You know, why am I getting up every morning? Mm -hmm. But she keeps on doing it, so. Yeah, there's a way in which this first part is is mostly descriptive, right? But then this one starts to make a kind of commentary on it, right? And I yes. think hopefully this line break on the word but has a lot of emphasis in terms of, you know, if we think of a of a poem putting forth an argument of a kind, that the line break after the word but, the enjambment of it, the, you know, emphasis of the word but, it really brings a lot of um, a lot of focus to the idea of this tension between like they're approaching the end of life and yet, right? And yet they keep going. So uh, it's an interesting moment in the poem and an interesting place to put the line break and enjam it. Um, uh, we can feel that effect, you know, the effect of it here in the poem. I see that we are approaching time and I had another example to share with you. Uh, I'll see if maybe I can work with Blue Stoop to get you that material. But what I'd like to do now is, um, is the kind of big reveal, which is to show you Lee Young Lee's and Gwendolyn Brooks' true versions of the poem, just so we can take a look at how they went about choosing their line breaks um, and what the effects are and how those compare with the discussion we've had here. So here's Lee Young Lee's poem, Eating Together. Uh, do we have a volunteer to read it out loud? Um, I can read it. Thank you. Mom. In the steamer is the trout, seasoned with slivers of ginger, two sprigs of green onion, and sesame oil. We shall eat it with rice for lunch. Brothers, sister, my mother, who will taste the sweetest meat of the head, holding it between her fingers. Deftly the way my father did weeks ago. Then he lay down to sleep like a snow-covered road, winding through pines older than him without any travelers and lonely for no one. So I know we only have a couple of minutes, but does anyone want to share any thoughts on your observations about the young Lee's choices and how they compare and contrast with the choices any of us might have made in the discussion we just had. There seems to be a change towards the middle of the poem where in the beginning it's much more uh, about the meaning and then the change is to create more tension when the father comes into it. You get different uh, and more unusual line breaks yeah, as if there's a change or shift in the, the meaning of the poem there. 
Yeah, it's interesting to think about and jam and end stop not as sort of black and white categories, but instead as a sort of spectrum, right? I think this is the first moment where we get a, some enjambment happening. All the other lines um, are, are generally pretty end stopped. And so the tension gets ratcheted up in this moment. Anne, you were about to say something. Yes, I was struck in terms of meaning by two things. One is that the my mother who will and then down to my father did, which really emphasizes the two different tenses so that you have the, you know, you're knowing that the mother still has a future, but the father is in the past. And then I also was really struck just looking on the page by the next line with weeks ago, period, then he lay down. Um, there was something very powerful of her doing that with syntax as opposed to a line break that felt like um, I think up until then everything kind of flowed and you know the the sentences ended at the line at the end of the lines or you had everything with commas and so that felt like a big uh, split that um, was very striking there's this split and there's also this um, juncture there so uh, those are the two things that struck me um, looking at it on the page yeah, yeah, absolutely. This emphasis on the verb tense, right? She's kind of frozen in the moment. She's about to do this thing that usually the father did. And here we have in the past tense, right? So that's bringing emphasis to the contrast between those two verb tenses. And there is a kind of sense that, you know, these are largely end stop lines, bit of enjambment here. Even here, then he laid down. Grammatically, that is complete. But as I mentioned before, like we're, we're, we're I think, still reading forward to find out what and where, you know, it's a very brief. Uh, moment of pause. And then these phrases just drive us down the page, but in a way, not in a way that's deeply enjammed and sort of frantic and, you know, full of energy, but in a very measured, um, paced kind of way, which is contributing to a tone, right? This is a tone of sort of reflection and meditation, it's a very quiet form of grief and loss. And so those kind of, the subtlety of just a little bit of enjambment with mostly end stop lines are supporting and contributing to that tone. All right, I'm gonna do the big reveal on the other poem. And um, as you can tell, you know, I could go on all day with this. Um, so if you have questions, you can email me. Um, but let's just hear this one out loud and your take home uh, assignment or you know, your party favor is to apply the same questions here, right? What are some of the differences you observe with Gwendolyn Brooks lineation choices and some of the ones we made when we played around with her work? and what are the different effects? And then the, um, the take home assignment is to take your own draft material, squish it into a prose block and put it through the same process or trade with a friend and put it through the same process so that you're not working with material that you're feeling super, super attached to. But let's close by hearing um, Gwendolyn Brooks' poem out loud. If we have a volunteer to read The Bean Eaters. I can read if needed. Thank you, Emily. Okay. The bean eaters. They ate beans mostly, this old pair. Dinner is a casual affair. Plain shipware on a plain and creaking wood, tin flatware. Two who are mostly good, two who would live their day, but keep on putting clothes, put, keep on putting on their clothes and putting things away and remembering remembering with twinklings and twinges as they lean over the beans in a rented back room that is full of beads and receipts and dolls and cloths, tobacco crumbs, faces and fringes. Thank you. Since we're at time, I'll just jump in to say, I hope you can notice how the earlier lines are shorter, many of them end stopped, many of them ending where the the end stop punctuation is. And then that last line just kind of bleeds off the page, right? This excess of stuff, receipts, dolls and cloth, all the miscellaneous items that are part of, you know, that make up a life. And so there's a way in which the poem feels rather contained and then just sort of like opens out and, and lets go of its boundaries. Um, so another effect to think about and to, to take away for your own toolkit I hope you have fun with experimenting with your own poems, maybe trading with a friend after you've put yours into prose form and bringing some of these lenses to your work at first in ways that are isolated and maybe seem kind of artificial, but in the end, in ways that are integrated and authentic and um, you know spontaneously related to the moment of the poem. 
um, and, and to feel uh, like a suitable match for what's happening in your work. I'm happy to stick around for another five minutes or so if there are questions. If you have to go, I totally understand. And I thank you all for being here uh, for this fun discussion about lineation. Oh, and I should jump in and say that Jean um, had trouble with her Wi-Fi. Jean also sends her thanks and um, she's encouraging you to attend other Writers on the Stoop events this fall. Any lingering questions? Hi, Ruth.